Pastor Ken, nightlife going live, uh, back out in the streets. It's a warm night, good night. Um, we've not had any problems with the weather or with people or anything like that. We did hear a few gunshots, but it's not a big deal. So anyway, God bless you, and we'll check in with you uh, before the night's over. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going over there. I'm not, I can't go over there with no camera. I'm not going over there. Mm -mm. I mean, I know some of them guys by face, but I don't really know them guys over there. I walked down all but a little bit, then come back through. Hey, June. It's the sandwich man. What's up, man? How are you? There you go. Is right two on. enough? Yeah. yeah. Did you like three? Yeah, yeah, hold me over. Thanks, bro. All right, Jim. Uh, appreciate it. God bless you. All right, now you too, brother. You said you guys got closer. That's a gun. Y'all step behind the car. Wonderful individuals here in the street. We'll be right back at it again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We have some folk wa uh, walking with us. They're doing a uh, documentary of sorts, so we'll see how that uh, we'll see how that works out. St. Louis, you know, is you know the the uh, has has been the murder capital of the country. Very very dangerous city, but that's not the whole story. North St. Louis has struggled for years with an epidemic, an epidemic of crime and, crime and poverty. poverty. It's poverty and violence. It's a deadly combination. The opiate crisis is the biggest public health emergency of our life. It marks the 254th homicide this year. We have a gun violence problem and we have a drug crisis. Within four or five months of me graduating, seven people I went to high school with were dead already. I come back from overseas, more of them dead. I don't want to say half, man. <laughs> but damn, I say one fourth of my friends, you know, either they daddy dead in jail or on drugs, or vice versa with their moms. Some type of broken home, though for the most part. St. Louis is extremely segregated. Literally, almost like the Civil War, most African Americans living north, uh, most white people living south. And there's something that separates them called the uh, Del Mar Divide. You know, you come up King's Highway, depending on which way you're coming from, one section where, you know, you got flower shops, people outside playing guitar, got the little hat on the ground, people throwing money in it. Million dollar houses, multi-million dollar houses, just south of Del Mar in these beautiful neighborhoods. But as soon as you hit Del Mar, you cross that, it's like literally walking into another world. You see bombed out buildings, apartments falling down. You know, you see drug addicts walking up the street. You might see a D-boy in the corner here and there. Like, even that day, like North St. Louis is growing up over there, it's rough already. Go outside looking at tore down buildings and place that look like Iraq or something, you know, look like a, a bomb just hit it, but that's just, that's the, that's the block, you know, that's where your family at, barbecuing and make you feel like, well, shit, I, I'm over here, I was placed over here, I guess I ain't supposed to be nothing but this trash and 
kids playing in the park and they gunshots ring off, you know? It's just a lot that make you feel like, why? Like, you know, what's going on? Like, the north side is an area that really needs some real help. If you look at the city, it's, it's almost like no one even cares what happens north of Del Mar in St. Louis. You know, there's a lot of people just barely surviving. You know, basically dealing with, with mass poverty. When you create an environment in which there's no means of being able to get out of what essentially is a ghetto, it becomes complicated. People don't know what to do or how to turn to get results. There's a lot good that, that, that goes on. In fact, most of our young people are not engaged in violence. Most of our young people, they're not dropouts. You got a lot of very, very hardworking people who um, are taxpaying, law-abiding citizens, and that's the reality of it. But this uh, region, uh, St. Louis City, is in crisis. There's an epidemic, there's a drug ep epidemic. Homicides are just, I, I prefer the term, fratricide. There's an epidemic, there's a real problem here. I believe that, I, I tell people this all the time, there's no Calvary coming to save us. And I think the mistake that a lot of times that people make is people sort of wait on the media or some leader to stand up and say, we need to do this. And that's one of the things that I decided I could not do, that is, wait on somebody else. Now let's have a word of prayer real quick. Lord, we praise you. We well, thank you for these goodness folk out there? Mercy. We thank you there are you. sons, there are daughters, there are neighbors. They're not aliens, they're not strangers. And so I decided that I would put my faith where it ought to be. New at five, a North St. Louis pastor on a mission to fight mental illness and drug addiction. Reverend Ken McCoy has taken his ministry to the streets of North City. Reverend McCoy says his ministry called Nightlife has already helped get a number of people into treatment. Reverend Ken McCoy will end the violence in St. Louis or die trying. We developed a plan, we got some vest, and we started walking. What we try to do is build relationships with people who are in these most dangerous neighborhoods. We meet Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We go out from 10 to 2, 10 to 1, sometimes uh, even later, depending on what's happening in the streets. It's a ministry of presence is what we call it. What's up, man? Hey, man. How you doing? Thank you. Well, man. Yeah. Okay, give you guys some water. You guys okay? <laughs> I wanted to be able to engage whoever, these young people, uh, these uh, addicts, gangbangers, or whatever the case was. I wanted to be able to engage them, and I wanted to be visible. I wanted to become a part of all things that happened in those neighborhoods at night. Hey, you want a sandwich, man? You want a sandwich? You good? All right. I appreciate you, brother. All right. I wanted to go where nobody else would, where everybody's scared to go. Show that God hasn't forgotten. We don't get all preachy. I mean, we just look at what the need is. Some people might be hungry. Some people might be thirsty. I take the time to know who these individuals are. Some will let you in their life and others will not. But I think I, I have to take that chance. I just have to take that chance. Hello, Pastor Ken, Nightlife. We're live. Heard some uh, gunfire, sounded like some uh, automatic weapons, but we pray that um, it did not result in loss of life. Uh, we're not fearful. I can't say it enough. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Gotta put the uniform on you. <laughs> gotta wear the uniform. It's more than just feeding a few people. You know, once you earn somebody's trust, you can speak into their life. You can't speak into somebody's life if you haven't earned their trust. So we take the time to do what we have to do earn their trust. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And God, we know that you've gone out before us and you have already made our way, our way clear. Hey, brother, how y'all doing? Doing well, doing well, doing well. I think we got some water left and a few sandwiches. Y'all want some water? Let me go ahead and see what I got left. Yeah. Do we have any sandwiches? The water's fine. I really appreciate it. No problem, no problem, brother. Mm -hmm. Now, Mac, Look, stay up, man. You too, man. Stay blessed, brother. All right. Y'all good? All right. Take care. Get the fuck out of here. Oh, G O D. All right. All right. You giving us, you giving us poison food. I bought that food. Poison. Well, give it back then. No, I'm What's gonna the... take dog. Okay, all right. That's fine. <laughs> Come on, what are you gonna do back then? Get down. All right. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm okay. trying to stop or whatever, but it's other folks that's coming in there. They're right. smoking too. Right. Right. Yeah, smoking right. too. Right. 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 And I got like 12 grandkids at my house. Right, so okay. it's, it's, it's and kind of And it's kind of frustrating for me to drink or whatever, I but right. I don't want to snake a cigarette. Right, I understand, okay. I understand, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I need to have a drink though. Okay. That's the thing, is that I cannot stop drinking because it been through my family. It been through my family or whatever. I bet you could. Change the way you are saying it. You can. See, okay. there's power in your words. And probably right. can steer you towards some counseling, right? Yeah. A group, and you can start uh, uh, building a new social network. So mm -hmm. y'all come and pick folks up? Yeah, if you want to, yeah. if you want to ride. Oh uh, yeah. We got a look. We got a um, church full of ex everything you can think of. Good everything you think of. That's right. We all ex something. That's right. All right, well, we got you, baby. All right, now. Thank you. Oh, looking good, Steve. I got you, man. I know you do. Appreciate it. Yeah, I think I got it. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So that means these neighborhoods belong to God too. Not gonna be able to turn things around by pretending that uh, nothing's happening. You guys ready? Ready, yep. Just about every night that we're out that um, someone, you know, wants to come to church and um, we'll go by and get them or see if they really want to go. Let me see. I did say I was going to do this. Hey, y'all. How y'all doing? Who was the young lady that said she wanted to go to church with me? Is she here? What's up, Steve? It was somebody that wanted to go to church. I don't remember who it was. Hey, sweetheart. Fine. All right, go ahead and go to sleep. I just wanted to come by just in case she said you wanted to go. Hey, I'll see y'all later. All righty. Well, I did my due diligence. They there. They don't want to go. <laughs> you know they, they, you know, they, you know they doing their thing. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell them I'm gonna come by and don't come by. You That's know, because right. they will remind you, you ain't no reverend. Your word ain't nothing. Burn in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Changing and turning your life around is a process. And I believe that we're part of that process, that if we keep showing up and keep giving them hope, 
that, you know, that eventually will happen. When I first started doing this, I met with a bunch of, you know, pretty big, pretty powerful pastors and just sort of presented to them what my idea was. And I think they thought I was crazy. I just felt like as somebody who professes a belief in a God who did all these miraculous things, that's my inheritance. I have to go out in the streets and I have to engage what's out there. And that's what we do. Hello, checking in again. We're kind of walking down one of our more challenged streets. These uh, areas, uh, they have endured a great deal. And uh, these, these are some of the most courageous people I believe in on the planet. What the heck is this? Why would you just do it like that, though? I don't know. That's what I... I guess they didn't know what else to do with it. There was a lot of bread in here. See, there are bugs on it, too. I, mean, I would hope that you cared enough for, for the people out here, you know, and just throw this down. Like, this is what you do to dogs. This is not how you treat human beings. These are human beings out here. These aren't dogs. These are not animals. Yeah. Don't do this, because this is demeaning to have somebody have to come get their food off the, yeah. off the ground. And I guess if somebody was desperate enough, and no doubt that happens, they would. But if you don't have time to do it, don't do it. You've got to respect these people more than that. That's the first time I've never seen that. Negative uh, thoughts and desires. I'm going through a lot of stuff. You know, I started drinking and drugging. You know, I, I, I think there was a, a cop out, you know what I'm saying, taking the easy way out. And I just. I ain't no bleeding on type of guy. You know what I'm saying? No, we understand, man. I don't know what so, happened. Listen, what's what, going what, on. Well, what, 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 what can we do? Y'all pray for me. I don't know. Just, I know right from wrong, but right now I'm just, I'm living miserable. You know, saying I just want better for myself, which I know the people around me that care about me and love me. My brother texts me, and you know, he concerned about me, want to know, you know. And sometimes I let my pride get in the way, and then it, it, it makes me, make stupid and bad decisions, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I just came up the north side, which I shouldn't even be going over there. I got this morning, and with barely even dressed, you see what I got on, end up over there drinking and drinking stuff. And I'm just tired of my life. I'm just tired of how I'm living. Tell me what you need. You need some clothes or something? Yeah, I got a, I ain't got hardly got no clothes. But I ain't no member to no church. There ain't no I problem, ain't no church. problem. What size shoe you wear? I wear like a 11. 11? I got you. How can I get in touch with you? I give you my friend number. So I'm going to call you tomorrow. You can just hang out with us tomorrow. Right. Right? Cool. Yeah. And I, you know, what time? I'll be, what time? I mean, be, I ain't got nowhere to be at. Probably be around time. 10 o'clock. Okay, then I'll be there. All right? Thank you, man. All right, Eric. Right. No problem, Take man. Take care. God bless. All right. All right. God bless you, brother. Call me in the morning. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Right. I got you. Thank you, man. God bless you. There's a shift change at night, and those neighborhoods become totally different. There were a couple of nights where I was, I was frightened. Uh, I wasn't afraid of doing the work. I was just frightened in that moment. Early on, we were walking down this one real rough street. It's a very tough street. And we finally got folk to speak to us, and they started warming up to us. And about a week later, there was, you know, a major bus on the street. And it just looked like that we set that up. And I remember the next time we went out, the young man uh, follows us down the street with a gun. He's cursing us and telling us not to come back. If we come back and we're real, we're going to kill you and all this kind of stuff. And um, I kind of asked everybody, y'all going up the street, let me just talk to this guy. And he, uh, well, punk ass red, punk ass nigga. 
You ain't no real preacher. You ain't nothing but a snitch. Motherfuckers been getting locked up ever since you've been walking around here and said, man, I ought to bust a cap in your punk ass. And actually that night I was I was literally prepared to die. And I'm thinking, wow, man, this is this is it for me. We walked on off the street and he told us not to come back. Well, in my understanding, I knew that I had to go back because my failure to return to that street would have signaled to them that perhaps I am some kind of police snitch. So I had to go back. But we decided to approach the street from another angle. And somebody came out and started shooting um, AK-47 or AR-15, one of those guns. As soon as the shooting started, I jumped behind a barrier. Reverend Brown actually was more exposed than I was. And he sort of ran. <laughs> But that night was really crazy, and we were both afraid. And we said it, you know, wow, man, we're getting out of here. The whole idea, man, is to uh, stay out there long enough, go out there consistently enough so that you become a part of that night culture, right? You become a part of it. So when people get out there, they expect to see people hustling, and so they expect to see us, too, doing what we do. Shots or not, but it scared the daylights out of Rev Brown. <laughs> you never seen anybody that old move that fast. <laughs> God bless you guys. We'll check in again before right, night's over. Hey y'all. Where's Felicia? Huh? Yeah, we got some. Where's Felicia? Thanks for having me. Well, if it was just Felicia and not you, I'd be asking for you. She is. What I miss? The water. Oh yeah, get it out of that bag there. Here you go, baby girl. Y'all looking good? May I'm too. Yes, you may. Thank you. I miss y'all last night. Yeah, was I sure I was out here? <laughs> How y'all doing? <laughs> yeah, I saw you last. Here you go. <laughs> what is that? Thank you. You got enough? No. You got more? Again. Hey! My name is Felicia. I want to change. I'm going to a live. I'm an addict. Like, my daughter just OD, like, in March. So I got a lot of stuff on my plate. And then me using drills is not really helping, but um, it kind of, it, I don't know, when I do drills, it's like, it takes me away from all the problems that I'm facing. She, she's exceptional, and as soon as she figures out just how exceptional she is, Look out, because I think she's going to be a, a huge blessing to a lot of young ladies who, you know, who she's going to speak into their life in such a way that they're not going to come nowhere near this. Thank you, Pastor. No, I, I mean, listen, we just love her right now. Yeah, we'll meet them where they at. We'll love her right now and, and not going to love her anymore once she turns around, just because we just, we already love her. Is it all right? Yeah. <laughs> One night, Felicia said she was going to get clean and we were, she and I were going to get married. That's my husband, whether you know it or not, <laughs> for real. Do y'all hear that? Y'all hear this? My wife is here. Go ahead, honey. I'm serious. As soon as I get clean and sober, he's mine. <laughs> I promise you. That's the nicest thing anybody said to me. Hey, it's Pastor Ken, Nightlife. I'm down here at the um, rehab center. A little frustrated that um, 
They have people that are trying to get into rehab, and um, most of these facilities, they keep bankers' hours. So people who are addicted to drugs, um, if they're going to get help, they have to do it between the hours of 9 and 5. Wow, that's deep. So now i got to take this sister back down to the hood. There's no curriculum in any seminary, any divinity school anywhere that tells folk how to go out into the streets in the middle of the night. In fact, if you would ask most seminarians and most of their professors, they would tell you that is foolishness. Why would you risk your life out there in those streets? Well, my hands have to be free to pursue the ministry. Woo! Every time I pray for someone in those streets. I don't see somebody who's helpless and who's hopeless. I see somebody who's been sitting in that place waiting on me or somebody like me to lay hands on them and speak life into a dead existence. That's what you do with your faith. God set me free when I made up my mind that I wanted to be free. Thirty-three children have been shot in the city Out this year. Out of North year. St. Louis, three people are Is dead. Is that? Oh, isn't that wonderful? My son and I fall asleep to the lullaby of gunshots in the distance every night because I'm the first mayor in over 20 years to be born, raised, and still live in North St. Louis. Four people were shot, Louis. three of them killed in North St. Louis. Gun violence has been increasing in St. Louis, as we all know, at an alarming rate. Conflicts are solved with a gun. They, they say the good die young where I'm from. In a way, I hate the hood, you know? The hood ain't done nothing for me, you know? Take my partners away from me. Uh, R.P. Craig, uh, R.P. Moley, rest in peace Ronnie, rest in peace Jen, uh, rest in peace Stump. They, they, they all victims of uh, gun violence. I have uh, seven kids. And I have one child in particular that um, I guess scares me. And um, that's my, uh, my son, Lyndon. My name is Lyndon Thomas McCoy. I'm the son of Reverend Kenneth McCoy. So many of his friends are dead now that I knew when they were little kids, they're, they're gone. Not to prison, not to jail, but to the grave. My first partner that got killed, it was gang related. So I was 17, so we didn't even get to grow up together, for real. The neighborhood I was born in and raised in was already a crip hood. They were already crip, so I was a crip and didn't even know it. Well, crip in the making and didn't even know it, so. I eventually became part of a gang myself. When you're growing up in a inner city school, you have to identify with one of these neighborhoods because even if you don't say that you're a gang member, the other kids are gonna know you're from that neighborhood. So if you're not banging with, with that gang, guess what, the other neighborhood is still gonna mess with you. So you have no protection. We were all raised and grew up together. So we all looked at each other as family and we were like a family. 
It is some place where they receive recognition. They're not treated as uh, less than. They can do something and be respected. We looked at it as all fun and games at first until, you know, them little fights turned into more violent things. If you're in that life, you have to be in it 100%. Because to be in it partially means you're gonna get caught up eventually and die. Somebody's gonna get you, somebody's gonna kill you. You can't halfway be in a gang. You gotta have your boys back, you know? If not, then you are gonna have problems with your boys and at home ain't safe if you don't ride, you know? I start feeling like there's people out here after me. I'm not trying to die, you know? I'm gonna catch them before they catch me, anything like that. So I started carrying guns. End up getting caught with one. But that's what I went and did my time for. I had a UUW, that's an unlawful use of a firearm. When you have a bullet loaded in the chamber, that's, they consider that that is you finna use it, you know? So can't, you ain't gonna have no time to load up a gun when people pull up on you shooting. When I found out that my, my son was, uh, you know, gang banging, um, you know, he was a crip, I felt like I was, I, I'd messed up as a father. I think there were moments when I was just too hard on him and moments when I was not hard enough. I wrote his eulogy because I was certain that I would lose him and he was just living that kind of uh, life. But at some point you have to just sort of let them find that proverbial brick wall and let them bust their head. And I think that's basically what happened to him the day he was shot. My friends picked me up from work, took me down to the neighborhood on North St. Louis. And uh, other, I, we call them oppositions. They came, rode up on us, and uh, shot the car up I was in 60 times. It seemed like the first 10 shots, though, didn't, didn't hit the car or nothing. So I'm trying to see, like, dang, somebody shooting. What are they shooting at? The shots started hitting the car, man, so now, you know, first reaction is just to get low and duck. And, you know, I closed my eyes and just, just hearing shots, just hearing shots. And I just knew a matter of time, like, yeah, some of these bullets are finna hit me and I'm finna, I'm not finna be able to open my eyes again. We crashed and I opened my eyes and I'm seeing light. And I'm like, okay, I'm still here, you know, okay. Now I can see the car speeding off. I tried to get out the car and try to run and I took my first step. And it's like my whole leg just fell from beneath me. So I'm like, man, I'm hit, they got me, you know? And my friend came back and carried me to, on the side of a building where I was hiding until uh, an ambulance came. My phone rings and I answer it and it's my son's sister who says, Lyndon just got shot, he's at Barnes Hospital. I, I actually fell to the floor and I jumped in my car. It was the longest drive of my life. And I'm driving and I'm praying. And I get to the hospital and they tell me he's on blackout. So I go in there and there's my son, blood everywhere, and he's crying, reaching up to me saying, Dad, they tried to kill me. But as a father, I felt like I had done and I tried everything else and I thought maybe this is my moment to finally get to this guy. And I looked at him and I held his hand and said, son, this is what happens when you choose that lifestyle. You need to do some soul searching. 60 rounds were fired into the vehicle that I was in. And I only got hit four times. I chose after that, man, to stop that shit, man. It ain't worth it, it ain't worth losing my life. I got a daughter, she gonna need me. They cheese, they cheese. Man, say cheese. He's a good kid. He's, you know, has just been caught up. Hello? Hey, girl. Hey, y'all. Y'all go on in there and have a seat. I think what's important to note that 
people getting caught up in the kind of lifestyle that my son was caught up in and people getting caught up in, in, in the lifestyles uh, that we encounter in the streets. I think it's, it's important to understand that it does not take much to get caught up. What one has to grasp is that your life makes sense to you. And when you encounter people who seem to be doing something senseless, their life makes sense to them. And the key for us is not to make a value judgment on their adaptation, but to expand their options. You see, sometimes in those streets, I, I just want to scream and say, stop using drugs, stop shooting each other, stop drinking, you're destroying your life. I want to say that. But note those times in your life when somebody had to tell you the truth and quote unquote straighten you out. How did you feel? And so when you are applying the truth, you may need to, to, to take in consideration where a person is. Hello, it's Pastor Ken going live. This is Nightlife. We ran into a young man last night who showed us pictures of his 14-year-old son who had been shot in the head. And I, I say all that to say that there's some of you who are sitting around whining and complaining about some stuff that I promise you, compared to some of the things that some of the people we encounter are dealing with, is really, really petty. And deep down inside, you know it's petty. That's all right. Hey, now. How's everybody? Hey, my, my, my son used to hang out over here. He called himself Lil' Crip. Uh, he called him uh, ALK. Okay. Yeah. Do you work at Captain Lee's? Yeah, that's my son. Oh, yeah, no, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's my little partner, man. Yeah. yeah. He trying to do the right thing, man. He, he got been around here. I know. He got them babies. He don't need to be around yeah. here. He been staying out of the way. I yeah, know. yeah, he I'll, need to. I talked to him a little bit, you know, and had yeah. to uh, get in his head, you know what I'm saying? And um, he been staying away from over here. You know, this neighborhood will suck you up if you let it, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. It's kind of like you come down here, you know, and um, you get stuck. You yeah, know. I told you, my son overdosed down here one year and got shot down here the other year. Yeah. Yeah. This corner particular. This yeah. corner right here in particular. No, it's a hot spot. Dangerous corner right yeah. here. Yeah. You know, everything happens right here on this corner from uh, shootouts to uh, car accidents. Uh, all the way up to, you know. Um, but won't nobody be tripping, no, won't nobody be tripping with us though. Right? No, no, y'all like, you know, y'all mm -hmm. got proper attire on. If usually if you're kind of peaceful and just like stay in your lane, you don't have no trouble. It, absolutely. For the most part, right, right, right. So, but yeah, this, this neighborhood needs a lot of help, man, you know. So what kind of stuff do I need to bring out here? Like some soap, face towels, face towels soap, toilet soap, uh, socks, socks, stuff like that. T-shirts, things of that nature. Right. Um, Cause like I was telling you, a lot of a lot of people over here homeless mm -hmm. and be out two, three days at a time and don't right. get a chance to rest up. So you know, I need resources. You right. Know and we get, we got a few connects as far as jobs if people want, and we help uh -huh. people get in rehab. Yeah. If they want to do that, you know what I mean. Right. Yeah. So we'll be back out here if it ain't raining or nothing uh -huh. next Saturday. Next Saturday. That'll work. And now, probably next Saturday when we come out, we won't have no cameras or nothing like that. Just be, you know, just be us. Man, All right, Cody. I'm looking forward to seeing y'all. All, right. All right. A lot more. All right. Hey, y'all, let's head back. She said they all know my son. They all know my son. They all know. Oh. But yeah, they can talk, talk to him a little more, let him know who I was. Yeah. But all that. I've experienced with my son um, made me more fit to do what I'm doing now. He has been my consultant the whole while I've done this. Anytime I run into a situation that is a little confusing to me or uh, some young person to try to figure out what set that young person's from and he knows all that stuff. I don't think a lot of people understand 
what it's like to grow up as a black dude in a black neighborhood from a predominantly black area. You gotta learn how to protect yourself. You know, you gotta learn how to move, you gotta learn how to operate. As you get older, as you're raised in that environment, it affects you and you learn to adapt to it more and more until it becomes a part of you. And I learned real quick that you never know what something could escalate to. You never know. It could start off over a comment at school, next thing you know, somebody dead and they drop. I didn't consider myself paranoid until uh, I went to the military and I met people from other cities and they were like, man, calm down. You, you, you always watching your back. You always, you always looking at something. And it's like, that's, that's what you gotta do. When I started the nightlife walk with Ken, walking through those neighborhoods at night when you see the helicopters flying overhead, the noise from shootings, and all of the other stuff that goes on at all hours of the night, then I saw the challenges that my students have to go through even before they get to see me in the morning. I mean, if they can come out of the north side or that part of the region and they make it through high school, and they still have enough drive and ability to get to college, I look at it, man, that's like a miracle. All the inner city schools always have the same problem with money. There's just not enough of it, you know? It's, it's insane. They have kids graduating high school with like a, a fifth or sixth grade education, man. I mean, graduating. I don't, that's not the kid that, get, that drops out or goes to jail or goes, you know, to juvenile. You know, that's not those kids. I'm talking about the kids who graduate and try to go to college. They can't read, some of them. We have, we have high school graduates who cannot read. You go south, there are better schools in place in which an individual is able to gain a better skill uh, or a, a decent skill, and then in return, you go out and get a decent paying job. There is a disparity there. You have a large generation of young men with no employable skills and no opportunity for economically sustaining themselves resorting to activities of the uh, illicit economy. If you have both parents home, you'd be totally lucky because most of them, that's not, that's not a, an existence, okay? What's also in, in uh, mass poverty is, is mass incarceration. The single motherhood rate in the black community the last time I checked was 73%. That's 73% of a male presence that's not there. So where are these young men getting their values from? Most of these kids, if given opportunities, kids would do great things. But a lot of them, you know, are just caught up in the situation they're in. The government itself has an obligation to make sure that those individuals who are underserved, who don't have the resources uh, in place, are taken care of. I'm not saying that this is a handout approach. What I am saying is that we have to make sure that city resources are going to those areas where it's needed, period. This is Reverend Ken McCoy, uh, founder of Nightlife. We're back out in the streets. No night, I mean a great night. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey now. What's up, man? How you been? You good? All right. There's some water in this bag. It's got a little chill on it. You reach out there and grab you some. It's in a can, but it still tastes good, man. In a can? Yeah. You got water in a can? Yeah, Anheuser-Busch donated it. No, it's good, man. I'm telling you. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Hey, man, try some of that water, man. Let me say, tell me what you think. Everybody can play. Man, that water tastes good, man. Just don't think about it being in a can. Maybe it's like a disappointment, man. Like, man that water was good. I, I didn't... Tastes like hydrogen water. Hydrogen water? Yeah, it's not purified. All right. All right, that's good sound. I got to go. You can get another one. Yeah, go ahead, give us that sound. We, we... Appreciate it. No problem, bro. Thank you. No problem. Y'all have a nice evening. All right, man. You should say something. Like right. 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 Most definitely. I shouldn't have said anything about that can. 
I'm trying to gauge whether or not I should keep bringing it out here. <laughs> and like, I didn't even know he could run. He running. What's up, man? Hey. Good. How you all doing tonight? God bless. Oh, Lord, have hey, mercy. What's going on, man? <laughs> hey, what's going on, brother? I've been all right. I missed you guys last night. I was yeah, trying my best. Yeah, to get. we're looking for you. Yeah, I see the cars up there. So I was trying to wait for you guys to come back. Let's get out of the parking lot. I had lot to use the bathroom. Ran away, Castle, use the bathroom. Came out. Man, we were walking so slow. I don't know I how in the world we missed you. I was like, oh. Oh, wow. Well, don't tell me that, man. But I'm trying to leave because I heard you got a hookup on the. Uh... I do. I've been telling you that for two years. Uh, so how's... Oh, listen, I had that hookup so long, I, I got a whole nother hookup now. It ain't even the same hookup I had two years ago. Uh, but I have to walk you into this place. Okay. I have to walk, walk you in there, but I can do that. I, I, I don't want to be here, though. Mm-mm. You look well. Yes, but I'm, I'm ready to go. Are you really? Yeah, I'm ready to go. All right. Well, I'm supposed to, to meet with those folk that want to go at my church Sunday. Okay. Darius to come pick you up. I'll be sitting right there on that barricade. Right in the barricade the up there on, on the track. Right, right beside this, this gas station right here. Right here. Right. If the sun is shining too hot, I'll be sitting right there in the street. All right. What, the, which one? On the side the dog is on or on the other side? Right here, on this side, right here. On this side right here? So you pass the barricade up the yard right there. Uh-huh. Where they cut all the bushes down at? All right. There's a back porch right there. It's the first house right here. You can't miss it. I know the house. So you get to the track, but look, you can't get up and see it. If we were walking down the tracks going this way, it would be on the left, right? No, if you were walking down the tracks going that way, it would be on the No, right. not the tracks. If we were walking down um, Arbor. Arbor, it would be on the left. No, it would be on the right. Okay, I'm way off then. It would be on the right side. Is that right behind the gas? Right. Oh, it's right there. It's, it's right there. You see this white line Yep. Yeah. The next top, and it connects to it right there. All right. Wow, we, I just sent you to the wrong place. We got it now, though. Yeah, we're right there. That's 11 o'clock Sunday. 11 o'clock Sunday. I promise All right. you, I'll be sitting there. All right. I'll be there. OK, I'll be there. All right, Mac. All right, thank you. All right, now. Thank you. All right, see you in a second. See you in a minute. All right, Mac. Uh, hey, this is Pastor Ken, Night Life. We had a great night. Uh, we encountered a whole lot of folk. Um, uh, Darius spent some quality time with people. And we got a number of folk who say they want to turn their lives around, they want to go to rehab, so we're going to do what we can to facilitate that. All right, well, anyway, we, um, uh, we are, we, we're out. God bless you. Talk to you soon. I guess I'll sit here for five minutes till somebody pop up. What's up, brother? He ain't gonna make it. All right, hey, tell him we'll be praying for him, though. You too, brother. You too, right on there. All right, brother. man. No problem, man. Prayers, Most definitely. So we can go ahead and roll off. I think sometimes I make the mistake of having um, the wrong expectation. What's up, Xavier? Good morning. Good morning. It's afternoon now. Go on and have a seat. How you been? We wound up right here called the Wells Goodfellow neighborhood. I wanted to be somewhere that the congregation was needed, make the area better in some kind of way. So this is what I want to talk to you about. How y'all doing back there? We are in uh, Matthew. Pretty much preached the same way to a handful of people that I would preach to, I don't know, a church full of folk. Nobody else had. Jesus ain't got nothing against nobody balling or being no baller. Amen. But there's a way to do After all this protesting is over, what's the plan? What are we going to do? What do we really want? We want justice. How does that look? Be specific. That's real.
kind of poverty, the kind of despair, the violence, the, the, the gun violence, the drug addiction, that's just some um, uh, uh, ravaging parts of our community. And communities where we worship, we sit right here in our major drug set, right here where the church is. You go right over there, or right over there. Not that everybody out there is engaged in it, but it doesn't take a whole lot of it to destroy a community, so. What are we doing, man? I've seen this city, and I've seen the spirit of these people, and I've watched uh, these folk fight for their neighborhoods, street by street, house by house. So if I have a message for anybody, or if I'm critical of anybody, it's not average folk, it's the church. Let me introduce myself real quick. I'm um, uh, Pastor Ken McCoy. I'm the pastor of Progressive Amy Zion Church. And I get very, very little support. And it's not because the res resources aren't there. It's just that my denomination, for the most part, has become a social club. And, and some good- I'm gonna interject a little more right mm -hmm. here. And reason being, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be disruptive or anything, mm -hmm. but this is the pastoral fellowship and we support everybody. So we don't beat up nobody. No, 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 I'm, 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 I'm it's just good. a second, mm -hmm. just a second. And the reason why I'm saying this, it's it's just for a second. Okay. this one ain't working right. Okay. I'll I give it back to you in a minute. Like I told the street minister the other day, he go on the corner and say, the churches are all wrong, don't go, we need to be in the streets doing, some of us need to be on the streets. Everybody is needed. And we don't beat up on no denomination. I was, I was just making a point. I know it. We don't beat up on no uh, political point. So I'm going to have to cut you off. And we're going to have to go ahead and get ready to close. Reverend Ken McCoy, Ken is the type of man that you would not always like the way he may address certain issues. Uh, because I don't really deal with traditional church folk. I don't. Yeah. I'm starting to kind of question the wisdom of that. It's the worst job. We want to present you with this explanation, thanking you for the work that you've been doing in the Thank community. You. Thank you. Reverend McCoy has been going out nights touching the lives of young people. Old the things that the Rev does are seen as so extraordinary. It shouldn't be. You just look at them, oh yeah, they Christians. You know, that's, that's just what they do. It's not. All these bombed out buildings, all this violence, you know, almost every street corner, it's a church. This is your neighborhood. These, these are your people and the world just gave up on it. There is such a thing as dead faith. If your faith is not producing a result, it is, in fact, a dead faith. God has given us power to do something great, and that is finding a service gap in the kingdom. Something that ain't nobody else doing. I ain't a nobody. I might have been through some stuff, might have been through some things, might have done some things, may have been on drugs, may have been to jail, may have been married multiple times. There's some things that I'm ashamed of, but guess what? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, and I was designed for greatness. What's the point in having faith if you're not going to take a risk, if you're not going to take a chance, if you're not going to put yourself in harm's way for the sake of a greater good. What's the point? You got 150 churches in one neighborhood. And they got the highest homicide rate in the country. And the church ain't a social club? Something wrong. Yeah. I have more patience, I believe, with people who are sort of trapped in the streets than people who who are standing on the sidelines critiquing everything. 
I don't put, I don't, you know, I don't care a whole lot about that. Maybe they're planning. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No matter what we face, Lord, give us the word, the attitude, the vision, the confidence to know that everything is going to be all right. Yes, Lord. Do me a favor, young man, knock on that door. Hey, June! Got to do a police knock. <laughs> You say he coming? Hey, what's up, June? This is Rev. Oh, what's up, man? Got some water and some sandwiches for you. Yeah, well, man, this water tastes good, man. It's just a can taste of the fur. So you trying to taste something in it. It ain't, it is just, yeah, I see taste. you, you know, <laughs> just relax and drink it. Why? Right. It just got the can. It got a, a can taste. I don't think it does though. You want one? <laughs> I just found out this existed. It's not. <laughs> oh, well, let's get your opinion then. It's not that bad. I'm telling you. I'm real thirsty though, so maybe I'm. Oh, that's what y'all talking about. Is it bad? I drink it. You think somebody will shoot us if we keep passing it out? Ah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, y'all have. All right, June. Take care now. All righty. Man, if you saw how much can of water I got in my house, I got cases of it. <laughs> well, I'm drinking myself. So uh, you telling me not? You telling me to? You want me to quit? You telling me to quit? You might as well. It ain't working. Man, I can't do that, man. I can't do that. Your camera's off now. This real shit. You act just like a puppet. Then tell me what to do. You're not down here every day. I'm down here three nights a week. Bringing the asses. Three nights a week. Ain't enough. Cause them other nights you ain't heard niggas still getting killed. What you doing other than? No, 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 no. I go. I be in the hood. I'm watching the hood. Ask everybody over there. Nights when the pistols getting popped. Is you there? I've been out here when I've been out here when the pistols been popped. I've been out here when the pistols popped. Cause y'all too scary. Man, ain't nobody scared of nothing, man. I, I know scared. I'm some I'm some things, too but too I, scared. I ain't scared. They the police, they do, they doing the job. We good, man. We good. They filming in the hood that he don't even Can know. Can you tell? Have not been coming out here for two years and a half now. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> have you ever seen me out here, man? No. Never seen them out here. They never seen them out here. Hey, look, man. Here's a brother from right around here, Marvin. I'm, I'm Haven't I been coming around here for two and a half years? Yeah. Don't I know everybody over here? No, hold up, brother. Here's a brother from the hood right here. He from the hood right know. here. I don't know why you're talking to him. Shoot. I don't know why that, that, that guy, you know, came after me the way he did. I mean, I thought we were going to have an intelligent uh, conversation, but shoot, man. It deteriorated real quick. So, I mean, I don't know, just, I, I wish I could save the world, but I know I can't. But I know I can impact a few lives with what I do. And that's what I'm gonna do, that's what I'm gonna keep, that's what I'm gonna keep doing. That's, that's, that was, you know, unfortunate. The one person that I know would come around here three hours a night and serve the people, and this is right. So I don't know what that was about. The St. Louis mayor says her city's racist past must be addressed. The ongoing issues of racial profiling, discrimination, harassment, and excess violence towards people of color. Of policies that have disproportionately impacted people along racial and economic lines. This is institutional racism. When I was coming up, the civil rights movement was sort of at its zenith, at its peak. Um, I remember that vividly. And so what it said to me was that, wow, white people are really against us. You know, they're really against us, so. I remember being four years old and my parents taking me to picket lines in Webster Groves. They were very committed to integration. 
it has largely not been good. And I don't know really how to uh, promote a sea change other than pulling back as many covers as possible. You come through the reconstruction years and you had a few years where blacks could vote and blacks started being voted into office and quickly whites said, this ain't gonna work. And they instituted Jim Crow laws because they wanted to protect power and protect resources and protect money. You had laws in place that systematically kept African Americans from being able to hold or gain footing within America. Then you go even further after the Jim Crow era. What we see is the area which was once heavily populated by white people. Those individuals, once integration came into play, they decided to start moving more west, start moving more north. So there was a white flight that, that took place. When everybody from the south started moving to the big cities for, for jobs, I remember this city here, man, a ton of manufacturing jobs back in the day. But they all moved out as African Americans moved to the bigger cities, they all moved out. Just do your history on any, any big major city. And you find all these African Americans living in the urban center. They all came here for jobs. My parents did too. When those manufacturing jobs left the city and went out to the county, they did this thing called redlining back in the day where they, they redlined out certain, certain areas where you could not live. They wouldn't allow certain people to move outside of their, their income. You know, but it really what it was, it was they were keeping African Americans from moving out of those neighborhoods. You have a huge cultural disruption which suppressed advancement beyond a certain point. Today, St. Louis is a city with a crisis on its hands. Here, where we stand, is the heart of the city, turned from a solid middle-class area into a vast slum. A slum that kept creeping out into the city. Some of us live in them, and some of us ignore them. They belong to us. We all have a share in the poverty, the misery, and the shame. When you create an environment in which there's no hope and people are actually born into poverty, one has to ask his or herself, is this justice, is this the American dream that so many people strive for? I would say no. Right in the middle of uh, Fountain Park, there is a statue of Martin Luther King. And uh, that statue of Martin Luther King, oddly enough, is fenced in, in a symbolic kind of way that says a whole lot about what black people have to deal with who live in urban centers like that. They're just sort of locked in. Hello, it's Pastor Ken going live. This is nightlife. It's kind of chilly out here tonight, but we're blessed to uh, be able to come out and we've run into so many wonderful people. These are our friends um, we love, care a whole lot about here on the Holdemont tracks. Uh, we pass out Narcan when we come out here also, and um, we're happy to hear that they were able to revive how many people? Three. Three people today. And so we gave them all the Narcan we, we have. How many blankets is that? Go ahead. Two. Four. No. Oh, there's one right there in the front. What's up, Greg? Hey, man. Hey, uh, hey. How you doing, man? Man, I ain't got no complaints. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> I got a lot of complaints. How are you? I'm blessed. I woke up this morning. All right, all right, all right. How you doing? You fine? Yeah. We got you. Hey, now. Hey, man, where you been? Sad thing. Might have been, might, may not have thing. been the worst thing. I will hear you. All right, all right. Yeah, you got some food? Yeah, oh, what's up? What's up, what's up, boy? What's up, bro? How you doing, man? Been on cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's water on my back. Go ahead, grab some. Right yeah, yeah. All right, now. Be careful. Right. Oh. Cool, bro.
I found this in the trash. This fool. Uh, but he had somebody bought. You know I know. That's why I ran up to you like yeah, that because I'm fresh. trying to I'm trying to load up when I go back in this vacant house. That's why I come out to get food, bro. Thank you guys. Yeah, I love this guy here. He is the only. I told you this. You know I told you. No, nobody does this. This guy is heavenly. He's got wings. He's an angel. Oh Lord. And and he, listen. This is not the safest place in the world. <laughs> and he comes. He does, he does come. I love him. You know I love you, bro. Oh my God. You know, I, I tell you that all the time. You know yeah, that, right? Yeah. I, from the you first time I saw you, I told you, I, I, I you know did. what you're doing. You did, you did, you did. All right, you brother. Did. Hello, checking in again. So um, it's good to be back out here. Ran into a young man that we've been ministering to for some time now who um, is now in rehab. Another young brother that we've been working with for some time. Uh, he has a job now, he's doing construction. So God is good. I believe that we should be doing this kind of stuff year round. It's not a seasonal thing with me. Somebody got more sandwiches? I'll have one bag. Okay, we good. Yo, man, where you been, man? <laughs> Listen, how many times do I call this guy's name tonight? Come on. Locked up, man. Oh, my God. He had to with a car that was stolen, man. What, working on it? Yeah, he didn't even tell me. Oh, no. And then when the police pulled up, he told me, uh, told the police that he didn't know me. <laughs> what about, oh? Oh, he back at mama's house. He is. He don't come around no more. God has blessed us in a lot of times and a lot of moments in our journey to be able to be at the right time at the right place. So one night uh, early on, we were walking north on Kings Highway and there was a young man who was sort of standing there with dreadlocks, tall, slim young man. He asked us, are y'all with the church? Just like that. And we are like, yeah, we're with the church. Well, I need to go with y'all then. I said, sure, man. So we're walking, and I happen to look over at him, and his eyes are warded, like he's getting ready to cry. So I stop, and I grab everybody's hand, and we decide that we're going to pray. It was a tactical move to sort of diffuse something that I think could have gotten potentially out of hand. He was squeezing my hand real tight. He was sort of into the prayer because I was praying for him. God, please help this young man, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. I was really praying for him. As soon as I said amen, he sort of threw my hand and um, backed up and pulled out a knife and started telling us about how he was gonna kill this guy. Somebody had done something to him pretty bad to just throw him off his square like that. So I thought about my son in that moment and I didn't see that young man. I saw my son about to mess his life up. Before I knew it, I grabbed him. I just grabbed him. And um, he was like, let me go, OG. And so I said, just give me a minute, man. Just give me a minute. I said, do you have children? He said, yes, I have a son. I said, OK. What is your son going to do if you go down here and get yourself killed? What's your son going to do? He just wept. He just broke down, started crying. We walked him to his block. And we got him through that moment. Later on that winter, I ran into him in that uh, White Castle on Kings Highway in Del Mar. So he said, hey, Pastor, how are you? I said, good, man. He said, um, you remember me? I said, sure, man, I remember you. Not, I didn't know who he was. Thought he was somebody else. I said, yeah, aren't you from Lewis Place? He said, no, man, you saved my life one night. Then I knew immediately who he was. Then he grabbed me and hugged me. And so that sort of inspired me to continue doing what I was doing. The Reverend Kenneth McCoy's vision and passion, it has truly impacted so many lives, both those on the streets and those throughout the community at all levels. 
Nightlife has evolved in a way that I could not have imagined it would evolve, it has caught on. We have Episcopal priests, Episcopal lay people, Catholic people, black people, white people, black nationalists, people with Ferguson protesters. I mean, it's about as diverse a group as you've ever seen in your life. Uh, Nightlife is now in Kansas City. Our first walk, there were over a thousand people. This is a violence interruption exercise. This is a group of uh, believers and non-believers, very, very diverse group of people who are saying that we love our community more than we fear what's happening in our community. I have to say this before I burst. The Ami Zion Church, we were forced at one time to sit in the balcony and sit in the back. And so it's strange that all the white folk that came in here <laughs> went straight to the back. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Reverend Hobson, let me say this about him. He has uh, taken nightlife in Kansas City, and they are walking consistently now in Kansas City. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, leave here, and we're going to head over toward Metropolitan Village. We're going to Corinth. Amen, somebody. We'll be distributing water. You, you need a vest. We're going to be about the Ministry of Presence tonight. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Give him a hand. You. Thank you, Bishop. What I'm doing is really not a big deal. I'm just walking around talking to people, praying for people. Not a big deal. I don't want to be cast in some kind of hero's light because I want to be able to inspire somebody else to do something similar to what I'm doing, perhaps much better, because this is something anybody could do. Anybody can do this. No, I'm not a hero at all. This goes beyond just social services. This goes beyond just counseling and therapy. This is about making a human connection and affirming and validating uh, people who may spit on you. And once you get out there, you'll find out, guess what? They're human beings, just like I am. And there's not a big difference. In fact, there's absolutely no difference. Really, we all just have different struggles. You know, in a lot of ways, St. Louis mirrors America in that um, America, for the most part, I believe, is still segregated. And if it's not geographically segregated, it's certainly segregated in terms of opportunity. We've made some progress in this nation, but laws cannot change the hearts of people. We gotta hit this thing with various approaches. We gotta hit it with laws, but we gotta hit it with relationships. I'm gonna do this as long as it takes. Because it's something I just can't walk away from. You know, I'm just a small, small cog in this whole deal here, but I still have to keep pushing and keep trying to bring light to it because I think the more you see it, the more you see how it needs to change. Man, if you can make it in the streets, you can make it in any type of uh, fashion in life, man. Facilitate the liberation, the salvation 
the redemption, the joy, the peace, the happiness, the power of somebody else. Love me for me.